Good evening, ladies and gents. How are we all doing tonight? Excellent. Well, thank you all, as always, for coming out to join us. Space-based measurement techniques have recently become critical additions to our tool set for understanding and mapping the damage caused by earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, landslides, uh, and yes, and landslides, oh, hurricanes and floods. For example, the ability to see through clouds to image changes on the ground provided valuable data for FEMA's response to last year's hurricanes Harvey, Irma, and Maria. The Advanced Rapid Imaging and Analysis Project, a joint Caltech-JPL venture, is focused on rapidly generating higher-level, near-real-time imaging products and placing them in the hands of the various natural hazard communities to help improve situational awareness for disaster response. Tonight's guest is a JPL principal, section manager, discipline program manager, and the project lead for the Advanced Rapid Imaging and Analysis Project. She is also currently serving as president of the AGU Geodesy section, and she was previously board chair of UNAVCO through 2011 and 2012. Her science interests include geodetic imaging of solid earth processes and natural hazards, in particular GPS data analysis techniques for improving understanding of earthquake and volcanic processes. Her personal interests include running, to the extent that once she competed in and completed a 100-mile ultramarathon back in 2015. It took forever, but she finished, which is far more than what I ever would have done. So, <laughs> so ladies and gents, please help me welcome tonight's guest, Dr. Susan Owen. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for inviting me to be here. Um, I'm really excited to talk to you tonight about a project that we've been working on for about eight years or so. Um, so this project has been to take data that we've been using to study natural hazards and apply it to disaster response. And sorry, I should have tested this out. There, there, got it. Uh, so. There's a difference between a natural hazard and a disaster. And this quote is one way to think about the difference. Another way to think about the difference is if a big earthquake happened in the middle of the woods and there wasn't any buildings around to collapse or any people around to be injured, would anybody really care? Well, if you're a scientist like me, the answer is yes, yes, you care very much. And you're really interested in studying the earthquake. But if you're the fire department, if you're FEMA, if you're the news media, you probably don't care all that much, and it probably you know, doesn't really get on your radar. So another example of a difference between a hazard and a disaster is from the recent event, uh, Hurricane Florence. So when Hurricane Florence is over the ocean, for most people, it's big and it's scary and it's massive, it's a hazard. But it doesn't become a disaster until it intersects with where people live, causing flooding, causing a lot of building damage. So when a disaster happens, it's really important to get information. And there's different types of information that we want in order to improve our disaster response. The first thing that we want is a really good forecast. So these are two examples of two different types of forecasts. There's forecasts for rain that helps us predict where the, where the really bad flooding is going to be, where people need to evacuate. And then there's forecasts for earthquakes, which are forecasts that occur on a much different time scale. Rainfall forecasts, we get days in advance and get updated frequently. Earthquake forecasts, we're looking at predicting the probability of a significant earthquake over the next 30 years. It's still useful for planning. If you're in one of the blue areas on this map over here, you don't really have to worry too much about earthquakes. But if you live here in Pasadena, you do. Um, and so we know that through forecasts like this user forecast that have been put together by scientists. Another type of information that we get that helps us improve our ability to respond to disasters is data that we collect during the event. So how the streams are rising after the rainfall has started in response to Hurricane Florence, 
or there's buoys that people put out into the ocean to try and measure tsunamis. So after the earthquake has happened and the tsunami has started, these buoys can measure the wave height of the tsunami and warn people on the coast about exactly how large it's going to be. But the event has already started. And then on the far right there, there's an image of Kilauea volcano, and those little dots are earthquakes. Earthquakes are another way of us understanding a volcanic eruption while it's in process, and also an earthquake sequence while it's starting. So seismic data is another important data set that we can measure in order to understand a hazard or disaster as it's happening. And then there's the information that tells us how has this hazard actually impacted people. So where is the damage? Where is the infrastructure down? Where are the bridges out? So following a lot of disasters, it's pretty common for police, fire departments to go out and do what's called a windshield survey. So they'll drive around and try to get an assessment of you know, where are the buildings damaged, where is the flooding, what roads are operational, things like that. And it's really important to understand in the, you know, after an earthquake um, or after a storm, what infrastructure is still in place. So this figure here of uh, the bridge collapse from the uh, Loma Prieta earthquake in 1989 is an example of where you know, there's transportation infrastructure that's down. And understanding the status of transportation infrastructure is really important, because in order to get resources into an area that's been affected by a disaster, we need to know, you know, are the airports open and operable? Are the roads open? Are the ports open? Things like that. And often telecommunications can be limited. So all of this information builds a picture that we call situational awareness. And all of this information is needed by people who work in emergency operation centers like this one. So FEMA, state, and local agencies have emergency operation centers that get stood up and manned during a, during a disaster. And while it might not look like there's a lot happening here, there's a lot of people on laptops, <laughs> maybe they're checking their email, but in disaster response, this is the room where it happens. So in a disaster response, what these people are doing is collecting information and sending it out to people so they know where to move the resources, where to move the food and the water and the crews to help get the power back up. So all that information is helping us build a picture of our situational awareness. So we can help improve this picture of situational awareness by making observations from space. And space gives us a unique perspective. And so here are some examples of viewing hazards from space. And I'm not going to talk about all the te different techniques that NASA uses to measure disasters from space, but here's, here's just a sample. Um, and the point that I want to make here is that space gives us the ability to monitor things globally. So you don't need to know in advance if the next volcanic eruption is going to be in Indonesia or in Iceland. If you have a satellite that's monitoring the globe, uh, you, don't, you don't need to know which particular region you need to look at or focus on. And space also gives us the opportunity to monitor things on a very large scale. We can see hurricanes from space. We can see the entire island of Puerto Rico from space, and we can see in this before and after image that after Hurricane Maria hit, a lot of the lights were out, so they had ma massive power outages caused by Hurricane Maria. We can also see the entire extent of how the Earth moved in, uh, in response to a massive earthquake. So space gives us the ability to monitor, to monitor globally and to see things on a very large scale. That's difficult to do from a car, from a windshield, or even from an aerial survey from a plane. There's another key feature of observing things from space, observing hazards from space, and that's that space is out of harm's way. So if you're an astronaut or you're in space, you might not think of space as being out of harm's way. But if you're a researcher who's collecting observations from an Earth-observing satellite and you're sitting in your office, it is out of harm's way. You're not on the volcano. You're not in the middle of the storm. And the importance of this, I want to illustrate the importance of this from a story from 1980, the eruption of Mount St. Helens. So some of you might have remembered that eruption. Uh, it was up in Washington State. 
these pictures here were taken um, from the location where David Johnston, a USGS geologist, was making observations of the active volcano. So it's, it was about six miles from the summit of Mount St. Helens. It was in a relatively safe location. He was measuring the gas being emitted from the volcano, and he was measuring how much the volcano was bulging. And these observations were critical in us understanding the activity of the volcano and for uh, having an area around the volcano that was evacuated. We knew it was very active, and so we kept people away. But he was there, and he was there the day that the eruption happened. And because the eruption went to the side as much as it went up, they thought it was going to go straight up. But because it went to the side in addition to up, and it went straight at the ridge where David Johnston was sitting and observing the volcano, he was killed in this eruption. So if we have the ability to make these types of observations from space, then that helps keep researchers out of harm's way and helps us make these types of data collections um, out, out of the way of where the researchers are in, in danger. So I'm going to talk about a particular type of observation that we're making from space that we, has been the focus of, of my research and many researchers here at JPL. So the term is geodetic imaging, which is really a fancy term for how we measure how the surface of the Earth moves. And I'm going to talk about two ways that we make those measurements. I'm going to talk about how we use radar to make those types of measurements and how we use the global positioning system to make those type of measurements. The radar image here on the right is showing how much the Earth moved in response to the earthquake in Nepal in 2015. And I'll talk more about that later in the talk. And then the image on the, image on the right is showing how much the Earth moved in response to the Tohoku earthquake in 2011 in Japan. And the arrows that you see, the red arrows, show the motion of the Earth in response to the magnitude 9 earthquake. So the arrow shows the direction and the magnitude. The, most, the, the stations that moved the furthest in response to the earthquake moved about 5 meters. The blue arrows show the motion caused by an aftershock. About a half an hour after the magnitude 9, there was a magnitude 7.9 aftershock. And you can see how, even though we've made the blue arrow scale a little bit bigger, you can see how much smaller those arrows are compared to the movement caused by the magnitude 9. So I'm going to talk first about GPS. and just want to say that the GPS satellites that we use they're the same GPS satellites that you use to make your, you know, to do your mapping and to get your position on your phone. Uh, it's a constellation of satellites operated by the Department of Defense. But we use this data in a different way than your phone uses the data. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about how we get the precise measurements, but I, I just mention a few things that we do differently. Primarily, we're using multiple stations, and we're getting a relative measurement between two GPS stations on the ground. And that allows us to cancel out a lot of the errors that cause the imprecise measurements that you get on your phone. Um, another thing that we're doing, so we're using an antenna. This is actually an antenna right here, a GPS antenna right there. That's a little bit bigger than the antenna you have in your phone. And we're tracking the carrier phase that the GPS satellite broadcasts. That's a smaller wavelength uh, signal, and so that allows us to get a more precise measurement. Uh, we also do a lot of uh, processing and have a lot of models for how the GPS signal is propagating. And combining all those techniques, we actually measure how much the Earth moves to a precision of about 1 to 2 millimeters in the horizontal and about five millimeters in the vertical. So that's about the size of a grain of rice. So that's a lot better than you get on your phone. <laughs> but it takes a lot of effort to get that. So this is an example of a GPS receiver in the field. Uh, so this, this is me um, many years ago. So I started out my research doing uh, GPS measurements on Kilauea Volcano in Hawaii. Um, Many of you have probably been to Hawaii. Many of you have probably heard that Kilauea has gotten very active recently. So 
back in the 90s, uh, there was an ongoing eruption, but it wasn't quite as dramatic as what's been happening over the summer. And so we would go out and set up these GPS antennas. That's the flat, um, flat thing right there. And then sit, it's sitting on a tripod, and it's centered over a benchmark on the ground, which is how we know where to go back to the same spot to make our measurements. And it's connected to a receiver, and that's collecting the GPS signals. And then that's my first selfie uh, taken while I was probably waiting for a helicopter to pick me up because I've got the, the flight suit on. That's the old way of collecting GPS data. And people still go out and set up uh, GPS antennas on tripods. But it's gotten very rare because, for the most part, we use data collected from continuous GPS stations. Uh, so this is a permanent GPS station where we replace the tripod with a permanent post that's put into the ground about as deep as you can afford. Um, you know, the, the bigger the drilling equipment, the deeper you can go, and the more stable it's going to be. And then you screw the antenna up there. You hook it up to a receiver, to solar panels, to, tele to, to some telemetry. And then the GPS data just comes to you. So this has been very useful for monitoring volcanoes. There's continuous GPS stations all over Kilauea volcano. Um, they lost one in the recent event. So this GPS station, NPIT, uh, which was within the summit caldera, so it was used to monitor how the summit was going down. Now, the volcano is erupting on the side of the volcano, and the summit is losing magma in, its, in, the, in the summit magma chamber. And as that summit magma chamber is deflating, the summit, the, ground, the surface of the ground is being pulled down. So that's causing this subsidence, this down, downward motion that we're seeing in this plot. And it's been a really dramatic uh, downward motion or subsidence being caused by this current eruption. Um, the ground floor of the summit caldera is basically collapsing. And as it's collapsing, it, it ate the USGS GPS receiver. Um, but that also makes the point that you really don't want people going out and making these measurements. And that's the way we used to monitor subsidence a, a long time ago uh, within, within Kilauea Volcano. And so it's, it's better that we have these remotely tel telemetered observations. So this is an image that shows the extent of the continuous GPS networks around the globe. These actually aren't all of the continuous GPS networks, GPS stations. Each little red dot is a continuous GPS station. But these are all the ones that GPL is currently downloading and processing. And you'll see that there's a lot of GPS stations in North America as well as in Japan. Japan was one of the first countries to install a lot of continuous GPS stations. They had 1,200 GPS stations installed in the 1990s. And so they were there at the time of the Tohoku earthquake in 2011 in order to monitor and image uh, how much the Earth moved in that earthquake. So this movie is going to show you the motion of all the GPS stations. And here we're getting a position every second. And the figure on the left is showing you the horizontal motion. So the colors show you the total displacement in the horizontal direction. And here, the little arrows are just showing you the direction. They don't grow with, uh, with amplitude as they did in that first figure that I showed you. That's being shown. The amplitude's being shown by the colors. And then on the left, you see the vertical. And this is going to loop through again. But on the bottom, you can see seconds since main shock. So the earthquake starts at that little beach ball. And then you can see the displacement propagating outwards. And you can see the total displacement propagating outwards and reaching its peak within about three, three and a half minutes from the start of the earthquake. And then you can actually see some of the seismic waves. So it's a really, it's a really impressive picture of the earthquake that we're able to see from these continuous GPS stations. And the scientists were really interested in this. But OK, I said this was going to be talking about disasters. How is this important for us understanding the disaster and helping to improve our disaster response? Well, that goes back to um, how we guesstimate the magnitude of an earthquake. So in most, most networks use seismic data 
to estimate the magnitude of an earthquake. And we've gotten really good at estimating the magnitude of an earthquake really quickly. And this is the premise behind earthquake early warning. We can get the magnitude of an earthquake within seconds, unless the earthquake is above a magnitude 7. If it's above a magnitude 7, our ability to see the magnitude of the earthquake saturates. And it's, you can't use seismic data alone to get the true magnitude of the earthquake if you want to get it within a, just a few minutes. And so this is an example of a USGS map that was generated at, from the Tohoku earthquake. And so 21 minutes after the earthquake, it estimated Tohoku at a magnitude 7.9. As more seismic waves came in and more analysis was done, 40 minutes later, it was estimated to be a magnitude 8.8. .8. Now you can see when you compare these two maps that are showing the strength of the shaking predicted from this earthquake. So strong and very strong is this yellow and, and orange. You can see it's much greater for a magnitude 8.8, .8, a much larger area, than for a magnitude 7.9. And the tsunami predicted by a magnitude 7.9 or magnitude 7 is going to be much smaller. The initial warning that went out to Japan, they have a great earthquake early warning system and a great tsunami warning system, but because they thought it was closer to a magnitude 7, the initial warning said that it was going to be a 3 meter tsunami. It was a 10 meter tsunami and 20,000 people died. So there's been a lot of interest in figuring out how to get a better rapid magnitude estimate. And that's where the GPS comes in. So Japan has real-time GPS capability. And they've been linking their GPS stations into their earthquake early warning and tsunami warning system. And a lot of the tsunami warning systems around the globe are using GPS now. Because you can see on the bottom, seconds since main shock. So about three and a half minutes in, you could see the size of the earthquake from GPS. So if you combine the GPS data with the seismic data, you can get that it was a magnitude 9 within enough time to give an accurate tsunami warning. Okay. And then this figure just shows the extent of the real-time GPS in, in Western US. So the, and I want to make the point that real-time GPS is being incorporated into the earthquake early warning system that's being built uh, for California and Washington and Oregon. So I'm going to switch gears now and talk about radar. Um, so radar, in a radar satellite, radar imaging satellite, it's transmitting radar down to the ground and then receiving the reflected signal. And it's called synthetic aperture radar because it's using the motion of the satellite to effectively receive data over a larger area. So it, it forms what's called a synthetic aperture. So it's as if the reflecting dish was larger than, or the receiving dish was larger than it actually is. And so that allows us to get higher resolution on the ground. The other thing I want to point out about radar in this slide is that it can see, what, another good property of radar is it can see through clouds. There's a lot of damage imaging and disaster response that's done with optical satellites. That's basically a digital camera in the sky. But if the area is cloudy, um, which it often is, uh, around hurricanes, then it's very hard to see below the clouds. And so radar is uniquely able to image the ground through the clouds. So how do we use the radar to map the surface motion? So the technique is called Interferometric Synthetic Aperture Radar, INSAR. And I'm just going to go over in a high level how this works. And so a really simple way of thinking about INSAR is to think about the radar satellite being kind of like a giant speed gun in the sky, measuring how fast the Earth is moving. Um, it works a little differently in reality than a speed gun. And so we're not just pointing it at the Earth and, and, and holding it in one position. So the satellite's orbiting around the Earth. So we have a first image here that's taken by the satellite, and then it goes around, comes back several days later, then we take a second image. And we compare the images, the waves received from those two images. We interfere them to form what's called an interferogram. And that's this colorful map down here. 
and that's measuring how much the surface moved between the first image and the second image. Another thing I want to point out in this lesson about INSAR before I go on is that the uh, measurement that we're making is really just the motion relative to the satellite. So we're getting a continuous map of the deformation, but we're only getting it in one direction. There will be a test on this at the end. <laughs> Let's see. So here is an example of an interferogram from an earthquake. So there's a magnitude 6.6 .6 earthquake in Iran near the city of Bam. So we call it the Bam earthquake in 2003. And Eric Fielding, a research scientist here at JPL, generated this interferogram. So I should explain a little bit more about what these the color bands, uh, how these color bands can be interpreted. So we, we call them fringes, and one fringe or one cycle is, say, from one blue band here to the next blue band there. When you go through one cycle, that's equivalent to 28, for this image, 28 millimeters of range change. So for each cycle, the ground is moving 28 millimeters. Another way, and maybe an easier way to think about this, is it's kind of like a topo map. So for each blue, like for along a line of, say, blue here, the Earth is moving a constant amount relative to some reference point in this image, the same way a line on a topo map is a line of constant height. And in the same way in a topo map, when you have lines really close together, that means that the terrain is steep. When these fringes are really packed tight close together, that means the ground is moving a lot. And so you can see that the fringes are packed tightly here close to the fault, which is here. And then they get spread out further away as you move away from the fault. And so that's one way to think about interpreting these images. We like to show the fringes because it's easier to see some of the details, but it is, we admit, a little hard to interpret. Um, the other thing I want to point out with this image is this was one of the first images where we were looking at the image. We saw that there are these areas that were black. And the areas that are black are areas where the ground moved so much in the, uh, between the first image and the second image that you can't form this interferogram. It's called decorrelation. Um, and the decorrelation in this earthquake, people noticed was caused by the fact that there's a city in here and a lot of the buildings collapsed. So it wasn't just decorrelation along the fault where the ground ruptured. It was also decorrelation in an urban area. And so this gave people the idea that maybe they can use this type of data to help look at damage following an earthquake. And so people here at JPL started thinking about, well, whether or not you know, this was something that we could do. And one of the things that, that we asked ourselves was, well, how do we show that we can do it? Well, talked about that. And we came up with the idea that we should look to see if we can image a building that we know has been destroyed. And we knew there was an apartment complex in Pasadena. This is a map of Pasadena that had been leveled in the recent past. And we knew we could get some radar data before and after to see if we could map that damage. And so this is, the, this is a technique that was developed uh, to map whether or not buildings had been changed or destroyed. And in this first map that we generated, we decided that the pixels indicating that the map, that the building had been destroyed should be red. Um, so red pixels mean that something bad has happened or less. And in this image, it's always a building change. So we, we were able to, to show that we could image this, this apartment complex. We weren't even sure we could see something on the scale of a city block. And so we were really happy to see that the radar could pick up something on the scale of a city block. But then we looked at these other red dots, and we were wondering, well, is that noise, or is that other change? And Sang Ho Yoon, who is the, the research scientist at JPL who developed this map and developed this technique, he went and he looked to see, well, what's behind those little red dots? And he found that for all those little red dots, there were actually other types of change, building change, that had actually happened. So I think 
This was like TCC doing something to their parking lot or tennis courts. And these other red dots, he went to Pasadena City Hall, and you can pull building permits. And he found out that for these other red dots, there is actually construction that had happened on the houses. And so that got us really you know, enthusiastic about the idea that this technique could work well in mapping building damage. The fact that we were able to see things on the residential house scale. So the next step was to then try to apply the technique to an earthquake. So Sang Ho took some data that would image the damage caused by the Christchurch earthquake in New Zealand in 2011. This was well after the earthquake. So this was done sort of in research mode, not in response mode. And so again, the red dots here, this is his radar-based damage map, show where there was significant change caused by the earthquake. And then we compared it for ground truth to an engineering assessment that was collected by, by geotechnical engineers over the course of four months. And we saw that there was a lot of correlation between the red that we saw on the radar and the zones that were mapped by the geotechnical engineers. So this, this was really promising as well. We also looked at individual buildings. And so we knew the Christchurch Cathedral had lost its spire. That was picked up by the damage map, as well as the CTV building, which was the building where most of the fatalities happened um, in this earthquake. And so at the building level, we were able to resolve that, that there had been damage. We were also able to see, in looking at this earthquake, that some of the red areas were actually caused by liquefaction, uh, when the ground liquefies in response to the earthquake, as well as landslides. So, and unfortunately, we can't really tell from radar whether the red dots being caused by building damage, liquefaction, or landslides. But if we combine the radar with a map of the ground, where we can see where it's likely to be a building, or landslides, or liquefaction. So the first earthquake where we applied this technique in, in response mode was the Nepal earthquake in 2015. This was a magnitude 7.8, and it, did, it was a disaster. There were over 8,000 fatalities. Many people's houses were destroyed. Many people were injured. We generated two damage maps for this earthquake uh, using two different radar sensors. So this, this particular radar sensor was, was particularly sensitive to landslides. So there was a village that was destroyed by a massive landslide, and we were able to image that with the, with the radar. I mean, we found out about the, the village being destroyed before we actually generated the damage map in this case. Um, but this was helpful for identifying other landslides in the area. There were a lot of mountain landslides triggered by this earthquake. And then we used a different sensor to image the building damage in Kathmandu and the surrounding villages. And this damage map was used to help uh, with search and rescue efforts, to localize search and rescue efforts in response to the earthquake. So this is a list of some of the agencies that were able to use this damage map in order to help with their response. So it varies from people who are using it to uh, inform ground response. So the USAID and the NGA um, were able to use it to guide where to, to, um, where to send search and rescue teams. Uh, other people were able to use it to guide where they would uh, collect more high-resolution imagery. So Digital Globe, a company that does a lot of optical imagery, more digital cameras in space. And so that's also, again, very useful for damage response, but it's a small footprint. They're only able to collect those images over a small area. The, one of the nice things about radar is it can image a very large area, and it can highlight where the damage is most likely to happen, and then you can focus your high-resolution imagery in those areas. We also generated the surface deformation map. And th this time, thankfully, we generated a map that doesn't have the colorful fringes. <laughs> so we can see the surface deformation. We overlaid the GPS vectors that, were all, that we also uh, generated for this earthquake. So you can see there was a lot of uplift as well as horizontal displacement. Why is this important? Um, 
One of the things where this is important is because it helps define the area that ruptured in the earthquake. You see, see here this, this green star is where the earthquake happened. The earthquake propagated to the, west, to the east. And so it wasn't centered around the epicenter. So by making these surface deformation measurements, we can confirm where the surface rup or where the fault ruptured and where the shaking is most likely to be great, the greatest caused by the earthquake. This is also important for future earthquake hazards. So this earthquake ruptured along a long um, fault zone. So it would be like one section of the San Andreas fault rupturing. It's not going to rupture the whole San Andreas. The same is true in Nepal. And so these areas adjacent to where this magnitude 7.8 earthquake happened are now loaded and primed for a future earthquake. So this type of information helps us with our future forecasts for earthquakes. It also helps us image where the fault rupture happened or didn't happen. In this case, the fault didn't reach the surface. Um, this figure over here is actually surface rupture that was caused by shaking, localized liquefaction. But the fault rupture would have come up in this region over here, farther from Kathmandu. And there was no surface break caused by the earthquake. And that's something that's easy to image with radar from space, but harder to do on the ground when you have such a large earthquake. And even when you don't have such a large earthquake, it can sometimes be easier to use space-based techniques to find these cracks than it is from geologists on the ground. And the two work together. So this is now going back to California, back in time a little bit. Uh, there was the Napa earthquake in 2014. There wasn't a lot of building damage caused by this earthquake, but we, we formed an interferogram. And we were able to look at the changes in the fringes here. You can see this crack, uh, this offset in the fringes in this figure. And the geologists used this, used this map to go out and, and find the cracks on the ground. And it turned out one of the cracks went right through the Napa airport. And they were able to inform the Napa airport that their, um, that their runway had a big crack in it. Uh, and this might not have prevented planes from landing, but it's, this, this type of thing is important for understanding uh, where the ground is being strained, especially where you have like buried gas pipelines and, and buried infrastructure. So these types of maps can help us identify uh, small shifts in the ground that could affect not only things like airport runways, but also buried infrastructure. So last year, we generated several damage maps for the Mexico earthquakes. Uh, there were two earthquakes in the course of about a month. And in this slide, I kind of want to talk about the timeline. I haven't really talked too much about how long it takes us to get these images into the hands of the responders, because obviously quicker is better. Well, one of the limiting factors in our ability to get this data to responders is the fact that we have to wait for a satellite to come over the area that's been affected. And so this timeline shows you the time of the quake. And then there was a one SAR satellite, ALOS-2, uh, flew over two days later. And then the, another one flew over several days later. And then it took us several days to generate the, the damage map. We call those DPMs. But that's the damage map. But then for the, for the uh, September 19th magnitude 7.1 earthquake, that caused building damage in Mexico City. Um, there, we were lucky. The first overflight um, of a satellite after the earthquake was within 24 hours. We were able to get the data and generate the damage proxy map and give it to the Mexico, Mexico's equivalent of FEMA within 24 hours, and they were able to use it for their disaster response. So this is, a, this is an example, or this is a close-up and an image of the damage proxy map that we generated for Mexico City earthquake. And so you can see the little red dots are where we estimated there to be building damage. So this was helpful for the Mexicans and the Mexican equivalent of FEMA, Centipred, to, uh, to find out where the buildings might be uh, damaged, not only within Mexico City, but outside of Mexico City, and help with their resource allocation. So at the same time, there are a lot of hurricanes happening uh, in the US and in Puerto Rico. So we had, we had a very active September last year. So there were 
Flood maps generated. We can actually use the radar to image floods. I'm not going to uh, talk about that tonight. But we generated flood maps for Hurricane Harvey. Uh, we generated a damage map for uh, Hurricane Irma when it hit Florida because there the wind it was more wind damage than water damage. And then we generated a damage map for Puerto Rico after it was hit by Hurricane Maria. And the Puerto Rican map was very useful uh, for FEMA. They were able to generate, they turned our damage map into a damage density map that they were able to use, again, for planning purposes to see where the hot spots were, where they needed to send uh, their aid resources, and where they should focus on in terms of getting more information about potential possible damage. So I'm going to return to volcanoes for a little bit. Um, so we talked a little bit about volcanoes before, but we've also been making uh, progress with helping the USGS in the Kilauea volcano eruption. So we've been working with them, providing them with uh, some, some interferograms, some SAR, INSAR data. This is an example. This is another one of these lovely fringe maps. Um, so this is actually an image, and as you can recognize, I recognize this, but it's the coastline of the Big Island of Hawaii here. So Hilo's up here. Um, the summit of Kilauea would be over here. Uh, and this is the area that, this area down here is where all the lava flows have been occurring. So there was magma that was pushed from the summit into the side of the volcano down to this area here. And when the magma moves there, it pushes the ground up and outwards. And that's what we're seeing with this interferogram here, with these fringes. And so by, this, by using this view from space, by having this view from space, that helped the USGS understand what the extent of the magma motion was. And the magma motion down here is really important because it is coming out uh, to the surface and forming lava flows and destroying neighborhoods and destroying people's homes. For a long time, the Kilauea eruption was a, was a kind of a friendly hazard. It mostly, the eruption was occurring within Volcanoes National Park. But this past summer, it, it has not been so friendly uh, in that it, it's, it's destroyed a, a lot of people's homes and uh, neighborhoods. So all these examples that I've been showing you have been part of a project that I mentioned at the beginning and with, that was part of the intro called ARIA. ARIA stands for Advanced Rapid Imaging and Analysis Project. So this was the project that we started a while ago because we as scientists would get asked for information when earthquakes and volcanic eruptions occurred. And we realized that we should spend some time automating the way that we do our analysis so that we can provide information reliably and rapidly as possible uh, to the people who need that information, not just for science, but for disaster response. And also, it motivated us to develop uh, the maps like the damage maps. So how can we use this data in a slightly different way that would be more useful for people who are interested in understanding where the damage is as opposed to, say, the earthquake process or the volcanic process. And so the ARIA project has been, been working on developing the processing systems, the down, downloading the data, automating the download of the data, um, and the processing, and then generating these research projects. Oh, sorry, not research projects. Uh, damage products. Um, and we've been working with a lot of partners over the years. And this is an ongoing project. Uh, we're always looking for ways to, to do things better. There's always uh, another satellite that we're trying to, to get into our automated processing system. But just in case you think I've been talking for a really long time about a lot of different examples, I actually cherry picked <laughs> um, the examples of the events that we've responded to and the, pro and the areas that we've processed data over. Some of these are disasters, some of these are floods, uh, a few of them are, are actual signs. Um, but for the most part, you know, we've, we've been working hard at this for a number of years, and we've worked all over the globe in trying to help uh, with situational awareness for these hazards and disaster response. So one thing that we're always trying to do is to provide the data faster. That's a big reason for the ARIA project to exist, is to get the, the information to the disaster response 
agencies faster. But as I mentioned before, the major limiting factor is when the SAR satellite is going to fly back over the area that we're interested in. And since the Sentinel satellites have been launched, that's a set of SAR satellites that the Europeans launched in, back in 2014 and the second one in 2016, uh, things have gotten really good, um, much better, because it's the only SAR satellite up there with free and open data policy. We've used data from these other satellite missions. Um, the Italians have a SAR satellite. Japan has a SAR satellite. I have flags. Um, <laughs> Germany does, and Canada. And oddly enough, from my experience, the Canadians have like the, the, the tightest data policy. We can get data from the, from, from the Aussie Cosmos SkyMed and from Japan, um, but, but it's hard to get radar sat data. Um, and, you know, and it's not like they don't want to share their data. There's, there's a lot of reasons why they have uh, closed data policies. They're not, they're not being protective. It's, it's the business model that they have for launching star satellites. Star satellites are really expensive. Um, but one of the things you might have noticed is that there isn't a NASA satellite up here. <laughs> um, all of the star data and the star imagery that I've been showing is actually not from a NASA mission. Uh, and that's coming up. So uh, NISAR, which is the NASA ISRO, ISRO is the, the Indian Space Agency. NISAR is being built now. They had one of their major reviews this week. Um, and it's being launched in 2022, uh, which is, seems like it's far away, but seems really close for us. Um, and it's going to be free and open data. It's going to have a 12-day repeat, which means because of the way that the orbits work, it means that over a particular area, we'll be able to image it once every six days. Um, and so that will help out a lot in us being able to respond to these types of disasters faster. And that's another thing that ARI is trying to do, is basically to get ready for NISAR so that once this launches, we have everything in place to take the data and uh, be able to generate the disaster response products. And so with that, uh, I want to say thank you to the ARIA team. Uh, it's a large group of people at JPL. It's been a really fun group to work with. Uh, a lot of the, there's a lot of names here. The photos here are people who provided um, figures and, and input to this talk. Um, and I think with that, I will go to my last slide, and we can open it up for questions. Thank you. Oh, I'm supposed to say, if you do have any questions, please go up to the mic in the middle. So thank you, Susan. Um, the first question I have is to do that high, high resolution uh, on the order of millimeters yeah. interferometry. I assume you need precision orbit determination. Yes, you do. So do you have uh, the kinds of things that were used on Topex, for example, laser range finders and, and all those kinds of things that were used to get well, very high actually, resolution? We're using GPS to get the precision orbits. Oh, you don't need the laser range finders that Topex had? You don't need the laser range finders, no. GPS okay. gives you a precise enough orbit. Well, that's good. Yeah. Uh, the other question is uh, your, your map of Pasadena that showed, you know, the red dots. Yeah. Did, did the building permits department want to really go and look at all those red dots and make sure people had pulled permits? <laughs> well, I think what, so what, what Sangho did was he was able to reverse geolocate. So he got addresses. Yeah from the map, and then, yeah, he was able, they were able to do that. Do that? <laughs> well, your researcher went and looked at them, but Pasadena wanted to say, hey, that, that red dot there, they never pulled a permit. Oh, did they want to do that? Oh, yeah, okay, sorry. That, that question, um, yeah, we haven't, we've thought about that, um, but Sangho didn't go to the Pasadena City Hall with the map. <laughs> he, he went with, with a list of addresses, and so, uh, so yeah, they, they didn't seem to see this as an opportunity, although we have suggested that, not, you know, amongst ourselves. <laughs> we want to use this for disasters. We don't want people shutting us down. 
Uh, okay. Okay, thank you. Um, so there's questions from online. Uh, see, with GPS data, can we detect changes in the shape of the planet due to gravitational variations as we orbit? Ooh, that's a good one. Um, due to gravitational variations as we orbit. So the best way, I, I mean, what I want to say is the best way to detect gravitational variations is with a different satellite that we have for measuring gravity, which is called GRACE. Um, and I'm trying to think of the, we do see tides, though, in GPS. So when you're looking at GPS second by second, you can see tidal variations in the GPS. So I'm going to answer that one, yes. Um, let's see. How can citizen scientists contribute to mapping, e.g., in Mexico City? That's a good question. So often when we do these damage maps, we, you know, we post them online. There are some news stories. We give them to disaster response agencies. And we, get, we actually get emails from people um, saying that they're trying to do their own you know, they're, they're citizen scientists, and they're very interested in the map. Um, I think there are, uh, I'm trying to think now, um, if there's a good organization to, to send you to. Um, off the top of my head, I'm not thinking, about, thinking of them, but I think there are some online groups that are trying to coordinate uh, damage mapping. I think Google actually sets up a, a site for large disasters where they try and collect information. Um, and so you might check out Google. Um, does INSAR have a maneuvering engine? Um, so let me see if I can answer. Actually, let me first let me say that uh, there is a picture of NISAR up here. We actually also have a model, a scale model of NISAR here. So it does have the ability to uh, shift the way that it's looking at the Earth. But in the NISAR orbital plan and observation plan, we're not planning on targeting it. So we're not planning on shifting it back and forth. So if a disaster happens, we're not going to task it to change the way it's looking so that it will image that disaster faster. Um, it does not have the resources to do that. Uh, let's see. Another question, can we, no wait, no wait, can we use these techniques for earthquakes within the ocean? Um, no. <laughs> uh, INSAR, well, uh, let me put it this, let me put it slightly differently. So, so Tohoku was an earthquake in the ocean. Um, it, it occurred offshore. Uh, the earthquakes down in Chile, their epicenters are usually offshore. And so if they're big enough and they cause motion on land, we can see the earthquake in the ocean. Um, but we can't, we can't use it if it's like way out in the middle of the ocean and it doesn't cause any surface, you know, hard land to move. Um, for GPS, there is a technique uh, called seafloor GPS, uh, which I didn't talk about, but they put, um, they put transponders down on the bottom of the ocean and then they use the GPS uh, on a ship that goes over the transponder, and then they do repeat surveys of the location of the transponder, and they can measure the motion of uh, the transponder on the ocean floor. So they can track the motion of plates, um, or the, the crust, the oceanic crust, that way. And they actually have these transponders off the shore of, of Japan, where they have fairly high rates of motion, and they've also tested them off the shore of um, Pacific Northwest, but it's not really out in the middle of uh, out in the middle of the ocean. So I think that's that question, and then that's it. So did you have uh, the, one of the first applications of uh, synthetic uh, aperture radar was Magellan spacecraft. Well, okay, the first time actually a planet had been, there. Yeah. and uh, after the first year, the second year, we saw the differences. And you can tell the changes. In them. That was back in 1980s. Yeah. Now, uh, how, can you quickly talk about the changes in the technology and the instrumentation from <laughs> over this 30 years period? Because 
back there, it was, we did the best we can do right. at that time. Yeah. Well, um, I know a lot of people who can answer that in a lot greater detail, but in my, I, I, don't, I don't go all the way back to Magellan, but in the years that I've been working with the INSAR scientists, I'll just tell you, you know, what, what I've observed in terms of our ability and the and improvement in the technology. One of them is, one of the improvements is the ability to get uh, precise orbits and to have the satellite track precisely the orbit. So in the early days of, of synthetic aperture radar, you, you might get an image over, say, LA, a repeat image over LA, but the satellite was so far, it doesn't travel in precisely the same path. And if it's too far away from the prior image, the baseline, uh, that they call it, if that was too long, you couldn't form an interferogram. And that happened a lot. And so the number of images that you could actually make pairs from was much smaller. Now with, like, with Sentinel, it seems like every time it's going over LA, you know that that baseline is going to be short enough that you can form that image to make, to make the difference. So that's the biggest change that I've seen. I know that NISAR has this sweepsir technology that I'm not even going to try to ex explain, but it allows the satellite to get a wide swath and yet also still get fairly high resolution. Because usually it's a trade-off between you know, the area that you're imaging and the resolution that you can get, the, the pixel size. Um, but with the sweepsir technology, they're able to get kind of the best of both worlds. Any other questions? Okay. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you for coming out.